A-N-D D-J-R-O-M-E-S-O-N-T-H-E And my ex okay. Alright, one, two, one, two Just to let you know real quick I have a YouTube channel And I do a show called The Basement And basically using the word basement Base being, you know, the foundation Meant being mental, your mind so just trying to know your foundation and where you come from and where you started as a DJ and your whole career, if you could. Well, first of all, DJ Rome. So I, I was born there. Actually, born in Port Wayne, but it's like it's the same town, mm. Oxnard. Um, Starting hip hop when I I was on my block in this little neighborhood called Lemonwood, and on Napoleon Street. Um, some cats had some turntables and they were spinning it up. I think they were playing, um, they were playing Request Line. Mm. Request Line by the Dynamic 3. Uh, my birthday was the next day. So, so I, as soon as I seen that, I fell in love and, and hit up my parents like, like Yo, I, I want to become a DJ. Is there any, you know, can I get some turntables or money? All right. So, um, so my birthday, instead of getting like a regular video games or something, whatever was going on at the time, I said, uh, I want some money. So mm -hmm. parents hooked up some money. I went back to that same street where, where the block party was, was at and um, hit up the DJ, oh, you got a mixer or anything you can sell me? And, and, and sure enough, he had a realistic mixer with no crossfader mm -hmm. uh, for 30 bucks. And, and I copped that. Then um, I had to save, I had to wait. I had to wait about three months mowing lawns and stuff to get my belt drive turntables. Mm. And uh, ever since then, that's, that's what got, got me started. I was in sixth grade. I had Mad Lib for math class. I would record this uh, radio station, KCSB, uh, University of Santa Barbara. They had a hip hop show every Friday. Uh, the DJ at the time was uh, DDZ. Mm. And he would actually like, play some hip hop. He would actually stop the record. He, I, I don't think there was a mixer out there at the time. He would stop the record and just like, or cut them in, like mm -hmm. jig, do some jigga jiggas. He, even, he would even be sloppy and just in the middle of the record, just being hype, just, <laughs> just cutting it up a little. So I would religiously record that. And it was, it's like an hour away, a college station. So I would have to, every Friday, instead of going to the dances at my school, I would stay on my box. And I, I had to like help the antenna out. Mm. I would like, you know, every Friday be, be on there, fall asleep on the box and have a fresh tape in the morning. So then Mondays I'll have my tape and I'll be bobbing my head and then Mad Lib hit me up once like, what are you listening to? Like, you know, what has your head all bobbing? And then I told him, I'm Friday, every Friday, KCSB, and then some hip hop. So, mm. so he, he, he was recording the station as well. So, <laughs> so that started off the conversation. I go, yo, I, you know, I just got turntables for my birthday, you know. And at the time, the first record I bought was uh, Crazy Cuts by DST. And I only had one record. I had two turntables and one oh, record. Did, right. So he was hyped up. Went that day and we cut it up on only one record. So, so we were like, yo, we gotta get some more records. So we decided to save up our lunch money. So we, would say we wouldn't eat and save up our lunch money, which was like, I don't know, $1.50, 2 right. bucks a day. So on the weekend, we would hit up the record store and we started getting records. And, and that's, that's pretty much how me and Malib started DJing. Mm. We started DJing together. This was probably like 1984, 85. A few years later, after, you know, we had some vinyls, this and that. You know, we were just concentrating on DJ, no beat making. Right. But as soon as I seen a commercial with the with the SK1 Casio keyboard, mm -hmm. and I seen the little kid sampling his dog and playing it back <laughs> on the keys, that sparked something in my head. Yo, that, I need I need to get that. Oh, how I got the money on that one? I forgot. But right. about the about the SK1, started doing beats and stuff on that. And I think it was only three seconds, so we would have to speed up the speed up the record on 45 mm -hmm. and keep it going even faster to, to get certain certain loops right and then we would record it on tape we would record it on tape and we had two tape decks well i had one tape deck and he would bring his tape deck from from the crib <laughs> right and i had two mixers luckily well one mixer was like an amp and i had my realistic mixer so he would 
he, we would um, record it onto one tape deck, the loop, mm -hmm. and and then after that, after we got the loop or do a scratch live or something onto the tape, we would play that tape and record it on another tape deck, and and someone would bust a rap or something or add more cuts. Right. And and, and that was before we had four tracks, so we would run three to four. We wouldn't do no more than four because then. It'll, it gets hissy, it gets right. super hissy. Right. So we did that for a while. Then Madlib finally got a nice sampling keyboard later, and it was over from that. But when we were doing that, right. Madlib, at that time, Madlib was tighter than me on the on the wheels of steel. He he, would, he was better. Like wow. I mean, we, we would we would both practice off each other. He was better. But as soon as I got that SK1, he, he fell in love with that, and he. He actually took it home. Like he would say, "Yo, I need this," mm. and, and I didn't. For real, I didn't see it for like a year and a half. When I got it back, it was <laughs> keys missing and stuff. <laughs> and uh, but it was all good because he went that path, and I just stayed, stayed on the wheels and Little concentrated wheels. on that. And 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 just through school, we met everybody in the crew on the Loop Back album. You know, right, Wild, Wild Child. Child. Actually, Wild Child knew Mala before me. They go back like fourth grade. Mm. I met them in sixth grade. Mm. But Wild Child was going to a different school. And he was back and forth, so I would see him a little bit, but then he would go back. So he was moving back and forth between grandma, grandma's house and, and, and his parents' house. Mm. So I did get to see him. And him and Madlib, they used to have some like pop routines. Oh, okay. They used, to, they used to do a little bit of dancing. Not like, not. it was more popping. and Right. Like, not like on the floor. Wild Child would do some floor moves, but Madlib was was sick on the pop. Mm. I, don't know, I don't know if he ever tells the stories, but oh man. Well, you it's know, he don't talk too much. So yeah, yeah. so with the loop pack and you being the, the, the DJ, like how was that whole experience? So this story that I'm saying, this was junior high. Right. We were uh, DJing, we started at 11. The production started at 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. So, so as soon as we hit high school, that's when uh, we met Can Kick there. Can mm, Kick, so he, shots to Can. He, he joined the crew. There was there was another cat. Um, I think he goes by Riff Raff now. His okay. name was Jason. He was actually part of the original Loop Pack. It was Wild Child, Mad Lib, Jason, and I was the DJ. We did mm. we did like a talent show. We okay. did a talent show at the high school. Got second. Uh, um, some some Samoan singers won. They were actually tight. Uh, um, we got. Uh, oh, good. Do you think? Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! On the phone. What, what up, Mike? What's going on? We're talking about as far as uh, the, the the members of Loop Pack. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Jason. So we did a few. You know, some talent shows and this was the, you know like. It was before the demo stage. Like we had tapes, we had tapes of our own. And, but once it hit the demo stage, it was uh, it was no more. Jason somehow he got out of it, or he went a different way, or I forgot how it really happened. It was Madlib, Watch Out, and I was the DJ. Huh. And oh, actually, the mother history before that. Before Loop Pack even broke out with the demo, Madlib made a demo with his cousin, uh, his name's Kai, and they had, I think it was on tape, and they might have had a 45. Mm. All you diggers, if you got it, hit me up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hard to find, and if you do find it, it's probably worth some money. Then after that, um, some cats that we knew from no we were still in de demo stages the demo stages the demo stages got us got us to uh, hook up with the licks uh -huh. uh, Tash was working at a sneaker store in Ventura which is like 15 minutes away from Oxnard okay and uh, watch out is a shoe fanatic so he went there and then, and then some dude helped him out he was rapping and then and then watch i had a demo tape on him and he, he gave it to me right and and then next thing you know he hit us up yo uh, 
I'm working on, I'm working with the group King T put together, it's called the Alcoholics, and we want to feature, we want to use one of the songs on you guys' demo. Mm. Like, all right, cool, we're. Right. <laughs> yeah, next thing you know, when we're in the studio with them, um, and we did that, you know, shot the video, did the, did the whole night. We did two joints on the first Alcoholic album. I got a kid, they want to loop back. Then after that, I think we worked on the next album. We had one song, and that's when D Claim, D Claim jumped on that song. He, that was his first release. Was on the second Alcoholic album, a song called W L I X. So I'm sort of jumping the gun through high school. We had like a crew with Can Kick, you know, the whole crew. We would all like. We would all like um, have like real like some type of like hip hop rules. Like our thing was not to bite. Like uh, <laughs> we, can't, we can't be biters. Right. Like try to come up with our own our own style. Um, I don't know what caused us. Like what we were listening to that made us think that way. But we were like strictly like we can't we can't be biters and we can't use break beats. Like we didn't know no ultimate breakbeats. Mm -hmm. Or if we did, we knew that people were using them too much and to stay away from them because we wanted to be different. Right. But Can Kick and Mad Lib, they would really dig into the jazz and find those abstract, you know, sounds and <laughs> right. or whatever they did. And uh, the alcoholics sort of sparked, sparked some like interest. Like, uh, I think the first one that tried to sign us was uh, DJ Pooh. Okay. Which is uh, the one that, that's involved with Friday? Because I think there's two there's two crews. Okay. So it's the one with, that works with Ice Cube, you know, part of the Uncle Jam's army. So Pooh had who had a label. He heard our he heard our demo. He loved it. He had a label at the time with Mercury called the Bomb Records. The only thing that came out of that was uh, I think believe Threat. His uh, this West Coast artist named Threat. We were supposed to be the third artist on that thread, then they had a female, I forgot her name, and then it was supposed to be Luke So me and Madeline were working at a grocery store at the time, and this was fresh out of high school. We were uh, 17. I think we both graduated when we were 17. And, and sure enough, as soon as, as, you, as, soon as uh, we had the meeting with Pooh, and like, yo, we want to sign you, we love you, we love your stuff, let's, let's do this. So the first thing me and Madeline did was quit our jobs, like, like, like <laughs> say, you know, fuck like this job. Right. We're out of here, you know, we made it. And we had a meeting with the lawyer going over the contracts, and the first thing the lawyer said was, make sure y'all don't quit your day jobs, because <laughs> this contract's crazy. It was like an eight-year contract and all royalties. It was the whole, you know, the full-blown regular contract. Mm -hmm. like, so luckily we had Madeline's parents managing us and they've, they've dealt in the music business. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> so they, they said no, they denied it. We were like, oh, what, what do you know? We, want, you know, we were young, we wanted to sign on the dot. Mm -hmm. So they didn't let us sign. So sure enough, a year later, well, no, after that, Tash was trying to sign us to Lau. Mm. When we were supposed to be there, right right when they signed uh, uh, Mob Deep. They had just signed Mob Deep, and they wanted Luke Pat. But they were giving us a whack deal, like super whack. Mm. Like like some Wu-Tang deal to where, like, I think for the single it was only 5,000. So, so we had to say no to that. After that, a cat named Broadway. Broadway, which worked with Loud, I think. Uh, he was in the mix with Loud, and 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 he tried to sign us, and and we went worked on a few songs in, in the studio and this and that, and that for some reason didn't work out, and the, the contracts weren't right, stuff like that. So okay, so next thing you know, after that, who hit us up again? Now with Warner Brothers. And this time it was a legit deal. Nice money, you know, decent contract, and, and we went ahead and did that. We went to Pooh's house, started working on the demo, 
and we were ready to go. We wanted to finish this in like two days. Right. Like we were ready to go. We showed up at his house, and I believe he had um, he had just got Pro Tools, and he had a, he had an engineer like trying to show him how to work Pro Tools. Man, we ended up it ended up taking us like four or five days to finish up what we could have done in like one day. So we did, we did, we ended up doing like eight, seven songs into it or whatever, because it was an off and on thing. And long story short, he lost the deal with Warner Brothers. So we ended up with no deal again. And then that's when we put out our own thing on Crate Digger's Palace, which is uh, a label owned by his parents. We put out Psych Move and like three other songs. Mm. ourselves pressed it up and that's how um, uh, Stone's Throw uh, heard of us I think uh, a station in San Jose was playing our, our song in the university and then um, Wolf heard it called the station yo what's that and then you know, that's Lou Pack at Oxnard they're unsigned they're independent label and, and he gave them the contact number that was on the record Contact. Well, at the time it was just peanut butter wood. Yeah, he, he was working for uh, him and Rasco were working at a uh, at a uh, I think it's a distributor or something. Right. And he had just got done uh, going to school for business, and he was I think Rasco's 12 inch was already out. That was the first 12 inch. Or I think he had a breakbeat. He had a breakbeat like Wolf breakbeat something like that. And then the Rasco was the first 12 inch. And then he heard our stuff, and then we were the next. Well, Rascal's album came out, and then after that, it was Luke Back. Mm. And that's what got that started going. So that's pretty much the story. Wow. A N D D J R O M E S O N T H E M I X. Okay.